So let's start out with the proclamation of March of Social Work Month. Who's going to handle this? Yeah, I'm going to kick us off, but we have another number of folks on the call today that are going to um, share. So um, I'll just start. Um, March is Social Work Month, so we wanted to spend a little time on that this morning. Um, we have social work happening across health and health services, and know that you've heard from some of us over the last year about how we've continued to serve the community um, through the pandemic. Social workers have um, adjusted the way they provide services to meet the needs of the community and at times have shifted to entirely different work as part of the COVID response. Um, and I think you'll hear a little bit about that this morning. Um, we've been able to do a lot of our work remotely, but many have continued to see people face to face in the community just to meet their needs. So today, just want to share some stories about the work as it's been happening through COVID and the impact of that work that highlights really the creative and different ways we're working right now. Um, so as we go through each department, I would just ask that the folks um, presenting introduce themselves before sharing their story. Um, so let's see, why don't we start with um, victim services? I think we have Melissa Overbo and um, Laura Sutherland here to share um, this morning. Hi, my name is Melissa Overbo and I'm a social worker with victim services. I'm here today with my manager, Laura Sutherland. In the face of this COVID crisis, we at victim services maintained our in-office crisis staff throughout November 2020. After November, our lobby remained open, but due to COVID, our office transitioned to a remote service. We had many discussions about when and if we'd respond in person to victims in crisis. Last September, I was on call the day the heart-wrenching triple homicide occurred. The family members of the victims were devastated. They couldn't understand the senseless death of this young pregnant mother and her precious little two-year-old child. On that tragic day, I was able to meet the family's immediate needs for emotional support. Later, a coworker and I helped the family through the agonizing days and weeks that followed. Due to COVID and in agreement with the emergency department at St. Mary's, we decided to stop seeing victims in person at the ED. But one day in November, the ED in our office made an exception to this rule because of the overwhelming need of a particular victim. I answered that call. This victim of domestic violence was in shock. She couldn't speak. She'd been stabbed, strangled, and beaten. She desperately needed medical attention, but she was so afraid. I was able to support her emotionally so she could agree to and receive the medical care she needed. Our work in victim services is primarily crisis driven. Because of this, we understood that despite personal health risks, there would still be situations that demanded our in-person response. In December, law enforcement called us with a special request to meet them at the home of a sexual abuse victim. This victim had been abused by her parent for over 10 years. But finally, this courageous victim was willing to report her abuse to the police and needed our assistance. I told her about her rights as a victim. I gave her emotional support and explained our program. Days later, I returned to her home to help her with an order for protection. Thank you for the opportunity to share just a few examples of the work our team does as we strive to meet the needs of our community. Thank you. Great, thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. Um, all right, why don't we move to adult and family services? I see Sarah Schaefer on. I wonder if she isn't sharing the example today. You got it, Amy. Thanks for sharing your story too, Melissa. That's nice to hear um, what other areas are doing as well. Um, thanks for having me this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah Schaefer. I'm a program manager in adult and family services, and I supervise our ACT team. If you're unfamiliar or need a brief refresher, ACT stands for Assertive Community Treatment. We're a transdisciplinary team that provides intensive supports to individuals with serious mental illness, most often schizophrenia. The services range from psychiatry, which is contact, contracted through Mayo Clinic and nursing, to chemical health, employment, peer support, and therapy. We typically see people at least three times a week, but we have the flexibility to meet people more often if they need that. For example, 
Someone we just started working with recently returned home following a long hospitalization, and right now we're seeing him twice a day to help him get stabilized. When COVID hit last March, we weren't sure how our services would be impacted. While we have waivers in place to allow for telehealth, it became clear pretty quickly that telehealth only services would not work the best for the people that we support for many reasons. People often didn't have the technology to use for video visits, or if they did have the technology, sometimes they weren't able to navigate the systems, something I think we can all relate to at times. Um, phone visits are an option too, but again have limitations. As with all the work we do, we've had to determine our visit structure with what works best for the person and continually reassess whether or not that plan is still working. A good example of this ever evolving plan involves a man I'll call Bob. Bob, Bob is someone that we see four to five times a week Bob's primary worker was able to work with him to adjust his schedule to kind of a hybrid model, where sometimes he's seen in person, certain days he's seen uh, with a video visit, and certain days he has a phone visit. As with anyone we're seeing in person, we have mitigation strategies in place for in-person visits, including staying physically distanced, um, assessing for symptoms prior to the visit, wearing masks, and limiting the duration of the in-person contact. Due to the hybrid visit plan and these mitigation strategies, even though Bob recently tested positive for COVID, no county staff were impacted, even though multiple staff were seeing him in different ways throughout the week. We were able to continue to provide services through contactless means as Bob quarantined at home and he recovered well. Another example is how the team has worked to support someone who is making end of life decisions as she has been diagnosed with a cancer that she has chosen not to treat. We've had to be creative in how we meet her need for increased support with COVID limitations. This has included things like having a brief face-to-face -face contact with her and then finishing up the visit through a phone call where the staff might be in their car in her driveway and she stands in the doorway or in the window to maintain as much contact as possible or sometimes more frequent phone check-ins. With or without a pandemic, people with serious mental illness continue to need and benefit from skills teaching, medication observation, substance use services, employment support, and a wide variety of other services. As you've heard throughout the pandemic, Olmsted County Act has continued to meet that need and we, we've been able to do that safely. We're thankful for the support that we've had from HCOM leadership and admin to allow us to determine the structure of the service provision and the realization that a one size fits all approach might not be the best. We're also thankful for the advocacy of leadership around vaccines Staff who chose to get vaccinated will get their second dose next week. And we're also very grateful for the collaboration with Mayo Clinic for psychiatry services. That has continued to work very well and it's been a wonderful asset as we've worked through managing COVID together. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay, let's go to public health. Sarah Stevens. Good morning. So I, uh, I'm focus more on the collaborative approach um, that social workers take within the county. And so I am going to read two examples from one of the public health nurses that I supervise, Tamara Issa. All right, so here we go. So according to, to Tamara, as a public health nurse in the Healthy Children and Families Department, I am grateful to be able to work in partnership with Olmsted County social workers. Here are a couple of examples of my experiences with social workers in the Disabilities Services Unit. The first is of a client whose toddler suddenly stopped communicating and was diagnosed with autism. With no family in Minnesota, having to deal with the perceived or the loss of, of a perceived once perfect baby, and a partner who blamed her for the child's condition, my client was completely overwhelmed. She felt deeply alone and unable to cope. At each visit, she would sob. This all changed after just one meeting with Lori Hilmer, who patiently explained the step-by-step -step process by which the family could access resources. Following that meeting, my client said that she no longer felt alone and thought that perhaps, after all, she could cope. Now, many months on, my client and her partner are jointly and happily engaged in the care of their son. Social worker Jane Clark has accessed financial support for the family and also transferred the child to MA, making him eligible for schools for autistic children. He recently started at Hoover School and is flourishing. The family is filled with pride for their boy and their hopes for the future are bright. All right, example two. 
Another client of mine was at a breaking point. Her child, her, her infant with Down syndrome, was hospitalized with leukemia. As the family breadwinner, my client was working full-time to pay for the mortgage, mounting medical bills, and family health insurance, while also trying to care for her other children and also stay by her baby's bedside. Stretched to the limit, she was running on empty and almost overcome with emotional, physical, and financial stress. At her darkest time, my client told me she was not even really alive, but was just going through the motions, putting one foot in front of the other and unable to see a way forward. Once social worker Kayla Krensky was assigned to the case, the situation became manageable. Kayla obtained financial grants for the family in amounts sufficient to allow my client to reduce her work hours and spend more time with her baby and her other children. Kayla also signed the baby onto MA so that those medical bills that kept my client up at night are now a thing of the past. The baby is still hospitalized, but my client can now focus on him without fear of losing her home. These are just two examples. I am mindful that without the collaboration of Olmsted County social workers, I could never fully support the families I serve. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Sarah. Um, let's see. So last but not least, um, Child and Family Services, and it's a story with a connection to the, the HRA as well. Um, so we have Jen Peterson here from the Domestic Violence Response Team, so I'll turn it over to Jen. Hello, good morning. I am not going to turn my video on because my internet is a bit spotty and when I turn that on, sometimes my voice cuts out. So I apologize that you can't see me. Um, so yeah, I um, work for the domestic violence response team. I am um, a senior social worker on the team and I do long term um, case management. Um, we are a branch of child protection. So all of our cases are child protection cases. Um, however, um, they are specific in that the child was within sight or sound of a domestic violence incident. Um, so I just wanted to share um, an example of um, a family that our team worked with and how COVID um, really impacted that and shifted our work. And then also how we were able to partner um, with the HRA to um, help this mother and her children. Um, so I um, began working with this mother um, approximately a year prior to COVID um, even happening. Um, we had worked through all of the family's child protection goals, um, the domestic violence worries around the children, and come um, March of 2020, um, this family's case was actually um, ready to be closed. However, um, with COVID hitting, it really impacted um, this mom's ability to um, secure housing for herself and her four young children as she was in a situation that she um, had recently left um, her abuser and um, really needed to obtain um, independent housing. Throughout the time that I had worked with her, um, she did qualify and did receive um, the housing choice voucher. And so her plan was to find housing and um, move out. However, um, as I said, COVID hit and that really interrupted um, her ability to move forward with that, partly because um, she now was looking at a situation where she couldn't visit a lot of places in person. She did not have access to internet. Um, she had to start homeschooling three of her children. Um, just a lot, a lot of barriers around that that prevented her from being able to um, secure housing, even though she had the financial means at that point to do so. Um, I was able to partner um, with HRA and our team decided that our work with this family wasn't done, even though the child protection worries had been wrapped. Um, but this mom was really facing um, homelessness with her children and then also um, had mounting pressure from her uh, prior from her ex partner and abuser to return to the situation as he was making her feel guilty a lot about the things that she was going through with the kids and um, at that time she had been staying with different family members. So through partnering with HRA, we were able to get her and her four children um, into temporary housing. So they did stay in a hotel from about April of 2020 um, until October, which is quite a long period of time. Um, however, without the partnership that um, our team had with HRA, she would have been living in her van 
um, with her four children. Um, so that was great. In October, we were able to secure her housing um, actually through the county um, because she was not able to find any private rent private landlords or um, facility landlords that would rent to her. She had some other barriers. Um, and so um, through that, she was able to um, get a home for her and her four sons, and um, which has been the first time since 2016 um, that she was able to secure independent housing for herself and her children. Um, and I just, this situation I think is very unique in that you know, it came in as a child protection case and that even though despite all of the barriers um, through COVID, we were able to partner with other um, areas of the county to be able to help this family and continue providing um, services for her and her children to really help them overcome those extra barriers that COVID put in place. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. All right, I think that's what we have for you this morning to just highlight the work of social workers across the division. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead. Otherwise, I think ready to move on. Thank you. Well, I'm not ready to move on without thanking Amy and Jennifer and Sarah and Melissa and the other Sarah and all the workers who profoundly improve the lives of people and let them reach their potential. and. I am almost moved to tears listening this morning. I don't know if that was your if that was your goal, but um, I'm I'm so moved by the the problems people have to face and how wonderful it must be to see your faces or hear your voices when people are so desperate for help. Thank you so much for everything you do and it shouldn't be just social workers month. It should be social workers year, every year, all year. Thank you. All right, Sheila, would you like to add something? Well, I, I think I can't really um, express as eloquently as Stephanie has uh, deep appreciation for hearing these stories, making it very, very real what our families in our, in our community and individuals in our community face and what a difference you all make in their lives. And um, I think you're lifesavers and literally and figuratively. So those children that you've described have a better future because of you. Our community is a safer place because of you. And you are living examples of our compassion and caring for one another. So this may be your profession, but I think it's really coming from your heart and you are the expression of heartfelt empathy and compassion for our residents. You, you are the ambassadors for that in many, many ways. And thank you very much for the stories. Thank you very much for the work that you do. And thank you for not giving up despite many, many challenges of, of the world we're living in. So thank you. And so, yeah, it's uh, no question. This should be Social Workers Month. Thank you to each of you, to Melissa and Jennifer and Sarah and Sarah and Amy and Amy and all of the staff. So thank you very much. Best to you, blessings. You are a blessing, blessings to you as well. All right, I'll, I'll just pile on, you know, I'm, before I became a commissioner, I had very little idea, you know, some of the struggles that families go through. And, and when I sit through meetings like this, I, I'm always, my eyes are always open and it's just amazing how, how many uh, how tough it is for a lot of families out there and, and what a great role you guys serve in, in improving their lives and making our community a better place. So thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, we got to find a way to share those stories more widely in our community so people understand, you know, the great things that our social workers are doing to help people, that their neighbors. So thanks again for sharing your stories.